<laughs> okay, everybody, I am back. I've got Peach put back into her enclosure. Got the poop cleaned up. Sorry, y'all had to see that, but that was actually too hilarious. Um, very perfect timing. That's not a normal occurrence. Chameleons are very much creature creatures of habit. So they generally will poop in the same place every day. Um, but today she was out moving around so much that uh, she just decided to let it go. Um, I had her out for about 25 minutes today and that's the longest time I've had her out in quite a while. Uh, I was checking her over and making sure she's all good and just letting her hang out and she was happy so I kept her out for a little bit longer. But chameleons themselves are not um, social creatures whatsoever so she does not come out very often and I respect her very much when she doesn't want to come out. So now I've got all of my, um, I also wrote summer squash in the date. It's April 16th, by the way. Um, I had to double check to write the dates on here. So I've got them all written up and then I just cut them individually and I put them on each pot. Um, this is like on other ones I've used tags and stuff, but I don't have any more tags and, uh, this will do just fine for me. So I just trim up each one and get them all put onto the pots. So that way they're labeled. I know um, when I potted them and what they are because a lot of the squash leaves look very similar and um, I just like to have everything labeled that I can. It's much more organized and neat and tidy and then I can um, remember dates much more effectively and all of that so that's what I like to do um, especially when it comes um, time to pick and stuff I like to know how long it will take from start to finish and just the whole process through so I've also got a book that I'm documenting everything on too so I've got uh, like it's just I'll show you guys it's a little notebook So this, I bought it from Staples, they come in like three packs for a couple bucks, I bought them forever ago, I've got a bunch of them just for writing and stuff and keeping track of things. So um, I just started writing down, like documenting what I planted and when, um, roughly like vegetables and their preferences found on the internet, and then I'm going, so I documented all of it, like Corn is generally 60 to 100 days, soil pH range of 5.8 to 6.8, they like full sun, they're a warm weather crop. And then I'm going to, um, and then I've documented more information on each crop too that I've found online, and then I'm going to compare that with my own findings and growings for here in Thunder Bay. And then that will allow me to have much more accurate data to share with other people too that also live in this northern climate. Um, I also come, like wrote down a bunch of like things that I looked up, like tomatoes don't like to grow beside cucumbers, and um, like corn and beans and squash like to grow together, that's called the three sisters, um, that's a really old, old farming companion plant. Um, tomatoes and carrots and basil grow well together, spinach, bush beans and radishes grow well together. Um, the beans and radishes provide support and pest protection to the spinach and they boost the nutrient availability. Um, yeah. And then like plants not to plant together. You don't want to plant beans and peppers like side by side. You don't want to plant tomatoes and potatoes side by side. You don't want to plant lettuces and broccoli side by side. You don't want to plant peas and onions side by side. Um, you do want to add flowers to attract pollinators, like marigolds and nasteriums. Um, borage is another one that's really good. Um, amaranth is one that I'm seeding that I'm going to grow in my garden area this year. Um, I'm excited for it. And when, and like, that's called like a polyculture when you grow them together like that. And it makes for stronger, more resilient plants and uh, much less loss from pests because one plant contributes to pest protection for the other and so on kind of deal like that. So I'm documenting everything, like when I'm planting them, like what, uh, what the temperature is like, 
um, the dates that I'm planting everything. Like I'm just, I'm documenting as much as I can. So that way I have it for myself for the future and to share with other people who want to get into it too. Because um, I'm all about sharing information and um, helping other people succeed too because this brings me so much joy in my life and I get so much value from growing plants and things and watching them start from next to nothing or a tiny little seed in this case and grow into um, big full huge plants that are supplying food to eat and nourish my body and uh, that's pretty awesome stuff like I used to just like mess around with growing food and stuff like I'd do a few pots here and there and then for the last few years I've been helping my uh, my grandfather my mom's dad work his garden too because he's getting quite old and uh, it's just getting to be too much for him so I've been helping him out with that like all of our family helps him out pretty much but uh, this is like the first year I'm really taking it seriously and doing uh, like a, a full-on garden and really like documenting it and learning and sharing what I learn with other people because I think that this is an important time to be doing this sort of thing I think with the uh, life's current events keeping us all at home I think growing our own food and learning about growing our own food and how to grow our own food and learning more about where your current food is coming from and how it gets to you and uh, the process that it goes through to get to you um, I think it, all of that just incentivizes you makes you want to grow your own food that much more because it's a little bit disturbing how a lot of the food is raised and things like that so doing it yourself as much as you can of your own and really appreciating it and understanding what it takes to grow it and to produce your own food and things like that I think it's important I think it's a great thing to do and um, I enjoy it I have so much fun and then when I consume the food that I've grown myself like oh my god it's just the best thing in the world two years ago I grew four tomato plants on my deck at my old house and I loved them and watered them with my Kangen water every day and they grew enormous. They were cherry tomatoes and they produced so many tomatoes it was unbelievable. And I would eat them every single day like all of uh, July and August and September and I just loved them and it, they were unbelievable, produced so much and I loved it and that was really when I was like wow like this is really cool. But I didn't really have space to do it there but now I'm here, I've got this is an acre lot, lots of room, lots of sun, lots of space to do it. So uh, I'm really going to dive into it deep. So I've also got um, water here and I'm going to show you guys how I water them, how I water them in. So these ones here say to pack them down, like to pot them an inch below, inch below the surface and then really pat it down well. So I've done that and I'm patting it down well and then I'll water them. And you see that the soil is not all the way up to the top of the pot now. And that's good. And the reason why I like to do that is because what I found is a lot of the times, like I mentioned earlier, the, the plant will start and then it'll fall over. There's not enough support around it. So if you leave some space, leave it down a little bit, then that leaves room for you to add more soil and stand it up a little bit better and get it more support that it wants and needs to uh, to grow upward rather than growing along sideways which some plants it doesn't really matter because when you plant them into the garden or repot them you can just kind of put them a little deeper so that that hides that um, fallen over part and you can just bury that stem and in a lot of plants like tomato plants the stem will actually produce roots so it'll it'll be uh, beneficial to actually bury the stem because it allows it to develop further um, for the root system which is very beneficial for the plants of ability to absorb water and nutrients and things like that um, so yeah that's one thing that I've noticed and like if you checked out the um, the pictures that I posted on uh, on Facebook and on Instagram of how I potted these tomatoes you'll see that exactly how I did it I actually take the there's the pod like this of like the root ball 
and then the plant comes up and I go all the way around the bottom of it and then up. And what that does is that allows all that area here, all that stem that's now down and underneath and beside before it goes above the soil. Um, all of that will develop root system as well. And with those peat pods, a lot of the time they actually will restrict the roots within them and they'll uh, kind of strangle off a small plant. So by doing that, little twist loop thing, it actually prevents that drowning out from happening because now that whole stem is there and it's able to develop a full root system beyond that little peat pod. Um, but if you don't do that, then often that little peat pod strangles off the ability of the roots to grow and it'll kill the plant or it'll just be like really sad and weak. So I find by doing that loop-de-loop -loop there, it um, prevents prevents that from becoming a reality and it allows a good deep strong root system to develop which is exactly what we want. So you'll see on some of the pots after I watered them they'll, they uh, have like a little hole kind of thing. I'll show you one second here. And get a little bit more water in these. So if you see this one right here See how it's all low on the one side? It doesn't really matter. Um, you can leave it just like that or you can flatten it off. Whatever you prefer really. Um, yeah, that's pretty much that. Now I'm going to just keep these. They don't really need the light until they sprout, but they like the warmth. Um, so you can put them on a heat mat if you want. You don't need to, but it works for sure. Um, as soon as they do sprout, you want to get them under light. You can have them under light from the get-go. It doesn't matter, in my opinion and from my experience, but uh, it's not mandatory. So I'm going to have these right on this table underneath this light. I'm going to lower this light down so it's closer to the plants um, because that's the only spot that I have left in my whole sunroom with light um, is right here. So that's where these ones are going to grow. and. Um, they will sprout and then I will continue to allow the soil to dry up and water and dry up and water and I don't let it dry up entirely but I don't keep it sopping wet like I let the top layer become just just dry on the top layer and then I water them I don't let them dry right out because they're very fragile young delicate plants and if you let them dry out too much they'll just wilt off and it'll take too much of their energy to recover and sometimes they get sick or whatever um, one thing I noticed is you've got to really watch for pests. I don't know why, but there's been a few of my milkweed plants that I've started. I use the same soil for everything. Um, I cleaned this whole entire room out, like very much cleaned it so that there, if there was any contamination in here, there wouldn't be any after. Um, and about well, four of the milkweed plants that I have in a 72 cell tray became infected with spider mites so I just took those cells right out and tossed them and uh, I've sprayed the whole tray down with the 2.5 pH hypochlorous acid water from my Kangen water ionizer and that's a sanitizer it's an effective medical grade sanitizer and it doesn't harm the plants at all so that is a, it's effective for killing like small mites and things like that so I sprayed the whole tray down with that and then I'll just keep an eye but if you don't have that I don't know what to say because I don't know I don't think you'd want to use like horticultural oil or neem oil or anything like that on small seedlings. I think it would be just too harsh on them. It would probably kill them. Um, so if you're getting like little micro infestations of spider mites, like so my conclusion is that there was spider mite eggs in the soil and um, because of the warm temperatures being on a heat mat and being moist, it created the perfect conditions for those eggs to hatch and then they came out and became a little infestation on those small little seedlings. Like they're only about this big, just tiny little seedlings with like four or six leaves and um, they became very white dotted and then you could see the webbing on them. So I just yanked them and tossed them and then sprayed the rest of the tray down with the 2.5 pH Kangen. And um, yeah, but I don't know, I don't, uh, None of the other ones have it. I keep a very close eye on it. I've got fans going in here and stuff. So it, it's, 
a true case of the eggs hatching and then becoming a little infestation. So as soon as you catch it, remove it, watch, check the ones around it and make sure if they are infected too, then get rid of them or take them to the bathtub and really spray them off really well with water and then just wash them for a few days after and spray them daily and like blast off any of the mites. I guess that would be the next best thing to do, but I don't suggest using like neem oil or horticultural oil or any sort of like um, insecticidal soap or anything like that on them because I think it would hurt them too much but I don't know that'd be up to you to try but yeah that's one thing you gotta watch because these plants remember these plants aren't meant to grow indoors they don't want to be inside our homes with very low airflow even with a fan it's so low airflow compared to outdoors right um, the light the just everything so they don't want to be in here, so we're forcing nature to do something it does not naturally do. So there will be some issues here and there, but as long as you keep an eye on it, check them twice a day or every day, um, it's not bad. You catch them, get them out of there ASAP, no problems, all's good, move on with the day. Um, don't let it get to you too much. So I'm going to show you guys another way that you can prep them too. So I've got this whole tray prepped, ready, full of soil. Um, and what I'm going to do with this one is I'm going to put the water on the tray itself and then what will happen is that will allow all the pots to butt chug the water up from the bottom because all the pots have drain holes in them, right? So you can, the two main methods of watering your pot or your plant in a pot is overhead watering and that really disturbs the soil um, but you can get a good even watering all the way down through usually. Um, and then another way to do it is through the bottom and that's what they call butt chugging. So it's basically absorbing all the water up from the bottom and it uses capillary action to draw that water from the butt all the way up. And then it'll also evenly soak the soil right throughout too. And that way you're not disrupting any of your soil on top. Because look at the difference between this now and this, right? This will stay like this, but it'll just become wet. And this is all like mixed up, right? So that's the two differences. I don't really care personally, um, but each to their own, right? I don't judge people who do the butt chugging or whatever they're into. I don't judge. Everyone's got their own way to float their boat and that's cool. As long as you're making your way down the river, it's all good. Um, but yeah, whatever you like to do, you can do. I use cafeteria trays. Now I've bought, in, I would say upwards of 50 cafeteria trays from the Great Canadian Wholesale Club. Love that place for that sort of thing. Um, and they serve me very well. I've got two sizes. I've got the smaller ones and then the full size bigger ones. Um, they're both great. I use them for all of my tray needs. They're good, they're strong. They've got about a three quarter inch lip on them so they can hold a decent amount of water. Um, I will soak this tray like one in like one full time. I just filled it right up to the top, and then I'll probably fill it halfway again, and then that should be enough to soak these pots all thoroughly entirely, right? So it's a pretty easy way to get everything nice and thoroughly wet and keep your drips and your spillage to a minimum. Um, I really like that. And then this is another thing too. These are like little miniature like dome greenhouse things and these come with 72 cell peat pods in them and then they come with these little thin lids too. And these lids are super thin and they're the same height as the base so you can start seeds in them but I don't really like them for starting the seeds. There's no airflow or anything. It gets real stagnant in there and I don't sterilize my soil. Like a lot of people will sterilize their soil before they start their seeds. And like, this is like an outdoor type soil. It's not the cleanest stuff. And like, that's why there's spider mites and things in it, right? It happens. So I find that when you put your, the whole tray with the lid sealed on top of it with your moist soil in there and your seeds, um, a damping off happened like tons on the one tray that I did do that like they would come up and then they just damp right off like they break like right at the soil they'd like disintegrate and the plant would just lay there dead and um, two I find it's more of a prime environment for mites or eggs to hatch in the soil because they'll lay in the soil dormant eggs for however long it takes till the conditions become ideal, right? And under the lid, in that warm, hot, moist, damp environment with the bright, oh yeah, it's perfect for them. So they just hatch up and become an infestation. 
and then I find the ones that I just seed out and let grow without any lid on them from the get-go, that doesn't happen. So I prefer to do it without the lid. Um, but each to their own, right? I have, this room is about like 50 to 60% humidity, I would say, on average, maybe a little bit lower, probably way lower. Um, but when I really water everything and it's all real wet, um, I'd say it gets to about 60% humidity. Um, so it's nice and warm and uh, yeah, they seem to all be really happy and do really well. So that's my suggestions of my own experience, right? Each and every one's going to be different. Here I've got a little tray of, um, so this is a dish bin tote, two bucks from Dollarama. I've also got like 30 of these things because they work great for soil mixing and using around the house and just whatever, right? And now I'm using them to grow out my cucumber seeds. So these have like nine or 10 plants in each one and I've got one, two, three, four. I've got four of them growing already and I started these on April 10th. So April 10th, which was six days ago, I planted these seeds in here and it says that they can take like a week or whatever to grow. Um, but these ones like to start, but they sprouted within two days and started growing right away. And I do feel very much that all of my seeds are starting quicker because I use the Kangen water and it's much more bioavailable and much more highly effective for it. Um, yeah, so I'm super excited to see these grow. What my plans are with these is I'm going to plant this, transplant this whole entire container into the ground at the base of like a trellis. And then I'll just have all the cucumbers grow in a bunch up a trellis and then that will be a bunch there. And then each container, I've got the four containers with like nine or 10 or 12 plants or whatever in each one. So each one will be its own little producing factory of cucumbers and I'll grow them up off of the ground because that makes it easier to prevent like pests and stuff getting at them like uh, maybe like a rabbit or whatever, right? So uh, that's what I'm going to do with these and it's all going to be an experiment because I don't have the money to be buying fencing to fence off all of my gardens. So I'm going to be trying other things to try to eliminate the risk of um, pests coming in and getting them and picking my cucumbers before I get them. So yeah, it'll be fun and I'm hoping for the best. And if you've got any ideas of ways to uh, keep critters out without doing a full fencing system, you share it with me, please, I'd love it. Um, there's one thing I do know is you can get a motion sensor light that has a socket. And in that socket, you can get a, like instead of a bulb, it's like an adapter. And what it is, is it's like you screw the light socket into the light end and that has the motion sensor light, but there's a plug on it. So you can plug a radio into it and you turn the radio on full blast. And then, so what happens is as soon as it gets motion sensored in the nighttime, the light turns on and the radio turns on full blast and it'll scare the heck out of whatever animals there and it'll take right off. Um, so that's something that I'm actually thinking about doing because I definitely want to protect my crops, right? Um, but yeah, so if you have any ideas, definitely drop them down in the comment section below and let me know what you think. I'm super excited for these cukes. Um, these are munchers, like munching, eating cucumbers. Um, they'll grow about like six inches long or so and uh, about two inches thick. Real nice munching style cucumber. Um, I have a friend who grew these ones last year and they were super so unreal so I've got a whole ton of them growing this year and then I've also got pickling cucumbers too but I'm just going to direct sow those ones into the ground uh, my successive harvests through the summer are going to be the munching ones and then I'm going to do the picklers right grow them to and have them so they'll all harvest in the fall time um, rather than successive ones throughout the summer because the Pickling cucumbers, I'm not going to be eating those raw as much as just making pickles with them because I've got my munchers that I'm going to grow to eat throughout the summer. And I'm getting so excited. It's crazy awesome. I love it. So pumped. And then these two, I've got three packs of these. So I've got these started here. I've got 14 plants here. And like, this is going to be a ton, a ton of zucchini. So I'm really growing extra to share and... Uh, you know, I'll be able to offer some, some good nutritious homegrown foods to other people too that I know. Um, so that's why I'm growing answers. But yeah, so I'll have these growing as my first crop of these ones. And then I'll have another bed, a separate bed, not in the same spot, where I will plant the second um, 14 of them. And then once I harvest the next batch, 
Like once I harvest the first ones, I can sow those seeds directly into the ground and have them grow and harvest them beforehand because it's a 54 day crop, right? So that's like a month and a half. Um, let's say two months it takes. So right now it's April 15th. So let's go two months from now. I'll be picking these. They'll be done. So it's April 15th, May 15th, June 15th. By th in theory, say let's go July. By July, I'm picking these and eating them. And then let's say July 5th, I plant them. Two months later, July, August 5th, September 5th, I can be eating them again, right? So... I'm going to do successive crops, like I said, I've got three packs, I'm going to have these ones grow, plant them outside as soon as I can, and then maybe like at the beginning of, uh, maybe at the last week of May, I'll plant some in the garden, the second crop in the garden, and then after the second week of June or the third week of June, I'll plant some more. And then that way I can just have them like all summer long, right? Because if you just do one planting, Say if I just did these ones, they would tire out by fall time, right? So, and I don't think they would really be producing anymore by that time. And if they were, they, I don't think they would be as nice and tender as the ones that are coming fresh, right? Because with the summer squash, you want to pick these early. You pick them when they're about like two inches thick and like five to six inches long, and they are the best things ever. I love them so much. You slice them up, and you put Parmesan on them, and you bake them in the oven, and oh my God, they are just unbelievable. So yeah, I'm right, right, right excited about the summer squash that I'm going to be producing all summer long. So excited. Um, so that's that. And now I've got this here. So actually this one fill up is gonna be enough. I had mentioned earlier that I might have to do two. Um, one fill up here and like this one's already soaked up all the way through, it's wet all the way. Um, and the others are starting to show moisture. So it'll be enough in that tray for sure. Um, so yeah, the next thing I'm going to plant, this here is a little package of micro greens. So this package cost me $2.79, okay? And it is 500 milligrams, 500 milligrams. So that's like one half of a gram of seeds. And that costs $3. So it's real expensive to be buying them like this. Um, I'm going to be looking into buying them in bulk for myself. And um, I'm really start, I'm really putting a lot of thought into creating like a seed bank for myself and maybe for others as well, because I'm really, like I, I understand the value of a seed and and what the potential from one seed is, right? And now experiencing everything that's going on before us, like I truly don't want to go to the grocery store. I just don't want to go. I don't even want to leave my house. So having a seed and the knowledge to do it and using the two main resources for it are sun and water, which thank God the sun shines most of the time and the water flows in a river in my backyard so to be able to do it is pretty um, pretty feasible right uh, I think whoever created this planet and this earth and this life and this world set it up like that on on purpose for us um, so yeah this is a mixture of a few different it's got 20% beet Detroit red 20% cabbage Pak Choi, 20% kohlrabi purple, 20% broccoli de Sico, and 20% radish china rose. So, it's just to sow an average soil in full sun in early spring for first crop in late summer for fall crop and sow thinly in rows 5 centimeters apart and cover with 0.6 centimeters of fine soil. So 0.6 of a centimeter, so that's half a centimeter, so that's just like a dusting of soil. And then it says, firm lightly and keep evenly moist. Seedlings emerge in 7 to 10 days. Sow every 2 weeks to extend harvests. So, these here, this will be like one planting of this stuff. Um, I think. I don't think there's very much in here, guys. So... Yes, I'm right. So what I'm going to do with these is plant them into here, but instead of just putting one per, I'm going to be putting a couple of them in each one. 
And it says to thin them out, um, like once they're growing, to thin them. But I'm honestly not a fan of that because it's like I just spend three bucks for half of a gram of seeds. One half of a gram of seeds. I'm not gonna throw them out once they start growing them. Are you nuts? I am gonna plant them in a way that they will grow for me and I won't have to toss them. Like who in the heck? Why would I do that? Why would I buy seeds, plant them, grow them, and then throw them out once they start growing? <laughs> what? No. Um, so what I'm gonna do guys is I'm going to plant them. Very cool. So, this is a nice package of seeds. There's a nice little variety. They look very cool. You wanna have a little peek? A little peek, I don't know if you can see or not, but hopefully you can. Um, nice variety of different ones here. Love it. So, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take a little pinch. And I'm just gonna sprinkle a few around in here. And what I want to make sure I'm doing is getting a variety of seeds. I don't want to put all the same ones in one pot. Because I want to have a variety of mix here, which is, I think that's so cool to be able to have a variety of stuff in one pot growing. Um, so I'm putting like maybe like 10, 8. Six. No, I'm gonna do six. Let's do six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I'm gonna take two of them out. So I guess that means seven. I'm gonna put seven in that pot. And seven in each pot. One, two, three, seven. Okay, so we've got seven in that pot and seven in that pot. This is a really fun activity to do. Um, I find it very relaxing and enjoyable to plant seeds and to just nurture them and watch them do what they do and sprout and then like eating them is the funnest part by far. But I also love the fact that like when you grow food it becomes so abundant in the fall that you have to share it. You got it. You can't eat it all. It's impossible. So if you want to make friends, grow a garden. Maybe that's my sinister plan behind all this. Maybe I just want to make new friends. So I'm growing a garden. It works. Trust me. When I was at my old house in town, I grew a garden in my front yard. Just like a... Not like a, a vegetable garden, but just like a nice planted garden with succulents and cacti. And it was awesome. It was cool. Like no one had ever seen a garden like that in Thunder Bay before type deal. And um, everyone that was walking by would stop and I would talk to them. And I ended up making like a handful of new friends because of it throughout the summer. Um, and I really enjoyed it a lot. Like I truly, truly got so much value from growing a garden and from the people that I met and the, the memories and the experiences and the opportunities that came about because of it, right? And I know that by doing what I'm doing right now, by planting so much abundance of seed, it's gonna force me to do something. And that something will be shared and I love it. Um, sometimes I'm like a little nervous to like connect with people or like I'll want to like meet somebody or like I'll meet somebody on Facebook and like I'll want to talk to them or like connect with them or whatever and I'll just be nervous to do it but having food and like be like hey like I've got some extra vegetables right now and I was wondering if maybe you would be interested in some would you mind if I were to bring stop by maybe tomorrow afternoon with a bag of food for you and then you can do that and, and bring it to them and share with them and then just like that 
this new friend has an image of you in their mind as the person that you, like, everybody wants to be, like, well, I don't know, I do. I want people to look at me and think of, like, a loving, caring, intelligent person who loves the community and has a lot of passion for what they do and a massive, huge heart and just does everything with so much love. And so by sharing and doing things like that, it concretes that image of who I truly feel that I am into other people's minds as well, right? So that's um, something that growing extra food can do for you. It can help create opportunities to recreate yourself or to make new friends or to meet new people. There's just so many opportunities that come out of growing a garden beyond eating food. Um, and that's something that I'm really looking forward to on top of it all. It's a lot of work, don't get me wrong. Like it takes so many hours of pre-preparation. Like for those of you that seen my post last week, like I've spent eight hours just ripping the garden grass up so far, or ripping the grass up for the one garden. Like that's only one of the gardens. I'm gonna do a whole bunch of them. So it's gonna be so many hours of work and so much time and effort and stuff. But honestly, I love it and I love what it does for me. Um, both physically and, and spiritually, like it, this shit feeds my soul like nothing else. Um, and that's what life is majorly about, in my opinion. If you believe differently, then that's totally cool and I respect you for that. But for me, life is about like giving and sharing and growing and connecting with people and offering value and, and advancing life and human quality and knowledge and just ending the suppression of life and and learning to flourish in what we do so i hope that you've gained some value from this maybe got a little bit of insight into what you are going to do with your own vegetable starting maybe i've inspired you to grow a garden yourself for the first time and if that's the case i'm so grateful for that and that's perfect. I want to see everybody growing gardens and I want to see everyone sharing food and creating new friendships with their neighbors and connecting with family that they haven't talked to or they don't feel like they have a reason to connect with family. They don't have any sort of value to offer. So having food can give you that opportunity to give value and to give things to those that you care about and love and you just on the norm wouldn't have something to just offer to them that you've created with the love in your heart and passion that you have in the form of growing and loving and appreciating what this earth has to offer. I truly believe that this is like a, I don't know, it's like a hidden gem and everyone who does it knows like this shit is real, like this is the real deal. And then people that don't know about it, they don't even have a clue, like there's just like with inside of you, there is some sort of explosion that happens through all of this. And there isn't words in my vocabulary to describe the feelings that I experience while doing all of this. So truly doing it yourself is the best way. So my goal with all this is to basically just set everybody up with some information and show how you can do it so that you can experience all that within yourself because I can't tell you like this will fill your soul and this will make you so happy and it'll fulfill you in ways that you truly didn't even know that you could be fulfilled and you can be like, oh yeah, cool, right? But until you experience it, that's it. The only true understanding is experience. So by sharing this information, I hope to create an opportunity for you to do this in your own life and to get the benefits that I myself and millions billions of other humans on this planet are also experiencing so have a wonderful day stay well and get your garden growing